Thank you very much, Karen. Well, thank you, Vaughn. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to warn everybody, this is the first virtual planetarium show I have ever done. Uh, so this is a little bit new and different for me. But I'm going to go ahead and just get on with the show. So I'm going to share my screen real quick here. And uh, what you're going to see, what you should be seeing now, uh, is what you sort of would see in the planetarium uh, at Westchester. We have a lovely um, uh, digital planetarium. Uh, everybody misses the old ball in the middle of the room, but uh, this is very powerful software that you're looking at here. But unfortunately, we're not in the dome. So it looks a little funny. Um, if you're familiar with any of the night sky programs you can run on your laptop, it's sort of a somewhere between that and a full dome because we're seeing more than one direction uh, as you would on a normal laptop, but we're not seeing 360 degrees. So I think you guys can all figure it out, but it does look a little bit odd. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just sort of take you through a tour of what's out there in the sky going on right now. Um, if you're anywhere in the area, you're knowing that it doesn't look like this at the moment, it's about to storm. <laughs> but, so here on our computers, it's always sunny. We're gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and watch our sunset here from Westchester. And we're gonna start with looking north in our northern sky. Um, so you should still be able to see the horizon and some markers there, north, northeast, northwest, just for reference. And uh, the stars, of course, um, are the little dots, and they are roughly appropriate for their brightness in the sky. So the brighter ones on your screen are the brighter ones in the sky. And I'm gonna start with this little um, uh, constellation that's kind of in the middle of the screen at the moment. A lot of you are probably recognizing that one. It is one of the most recognized constellations, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, but that is our Big Dipper. That's the one that most kids know. It's a very easy one to see. It's got seven really bright stars and it looks exactly like a big spoon. Um, at this time, well, this time of year, this is probably around 10 o'clock at night when it's nice and dark. It's kind of upside down. It's got a handle and the scooper part and it's sort of upside down. But a lot of people recognize that as the Big Dipper. Up in this general direction, a little farther up overhead, what you'll notice this time of year is a nice bright star over here, uh, kind of brighter than anything in the general area. And I want to show you that one for a minute. Well, we are going to go back to the Dipper, but I wanted to show you that one because it has a name. It's called Arcturus. Uh, we'll go ahead and put its name on it. By the way, every star in the sky has a name. These have been named for thousands of years, all of the different cultures in the world looked at the stars, named the stars, made constellations. So if you go on the internet and you find a place that says you can name a star for $100, that's not true. <laughs> they already have names. Save your money. Please don't buy a star. Uh, it doesn't really work. But I wanted to show you Arcturus. There's a really cute way to remember this star's name because if you notice that the, the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper kind of points to it if you follow it. And of course, another name for a curve is an arc. So a lot of people know the little rhyme, follow the arc to Arcturus. And that's helped you remember that particular star's name. Now, Arcturus lives in a totally different constellation than the big oh, no, I don't. And it's called Bootes. Uh, and Bootes, in this particular picture, he's upside down at the moment. Um, and there's some discussion as to what really is the origin of this in the Greek mythology. There's a lot of debate about it, um, but a lot of people kind of agree that he's supposed to be a herdsman. Um, and in fact, the dipper can be seen as sort of his plow, but it's not really agreed on that that's exactly what they were going for. But he is up there, and what most people notice is that without the picture, this kind of looks like a kite. Um, that's what I see when I look up there. I did have one person tell me they thought it looked like an upside down ice cream cone. So, you know, whatever works for you is fine. You can use your imagination. That's what those people did a long time ago. But he's supposed to be some kind of person and exactly what he's up there doing and, and how he's related to anybody else in mythology is sort of up for debate. But I thought I'd show you the whole constellation. Arcturus is the brightest star in that one, right at his feet, right at the, the tail of the kite. So I'm going to get rid of Odes and Arcturus, and we're going to go back to just the Big Dipper, because there's another Dipper up there that a lot of people know. There's a big one. There's also a little one. So we'll put that one up there. It's harder to find. Um, for most people, especially if you guys, had, you know, at the Naked Pilgrim, it's very, very nice dark skies, but in most people's towns, backyards, the bright stars are about the only ones you see, and the Little Dipper doesn't have a lot of bright stars. So while the Big Dipper is easy, it jumps right out at you, Little Dipper is a lot harder 
but it does look exactly like the big one. It's just smaller. It's got a curved handle. It's got a scooper part that you put things in and they're always right across from each other. So that's a helpful little tip. The handles point opposite directions and whatever is in one dipper can kind of fall right into the other dipper. Now, I wanted to show you another one of those star names. Like I said, every single star up there has a name. Don't ask me to name them all. I can't possibly memorize them all. Um, but this one I is a pretty fun one to remember. Right at the end of the little dipper's handle is a star called Polaris. And a lot of people have never heard of that particular name but it goes by a nickname called the North Star. Most people have heard of the North Star. For a lot of folks, they've heard of it. They know that it's really special. Uh, it, it gets talked about a lot. It's mentioned in songs and poems and poetry and, and plays and all kinds of stuff. But a lot of folks, they don't really know why. And one of the guesses is typically maybe it's the brightest star in the night sky. And that would be a good guess because Certainly there's got to be one that's the brightest and the brightest one would be very special, but it's not Polaris. Polaris is not actually very bright at all. You can see Arcturus way up at the top is way brighter than that. There's another star off to the east that's way brighter than Polaris. So it turns out Polaris is number 50 on the list. So there's a lot of stars ahead of it, but it is a very special star and there's a reason why it gets talked about all the time. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to put our sky in motion and like it would normally do. So things will rise in the east and they'll set in the west, but we're gonna speed it up so that we don't have to wait forever. And when we do that, it kind of becomes obvious what's different about that North Star Polaris. If you're watching the screen now, you should be seeing the whole thing move. And Polaris is the only thing on the screen that's not moving. And in fact, it's the center of all of the motion, even the sun, which is going across the sky. And I've magically kept the sky dark while the sun goes across the sky. Even the sun is moving. So Polaris is the only star in the sky that never moves. Now, technically, none of the stars in the sky move in 24 hours. It looks like they're moving, but it's really the Earth. The Earth is the thing that's turning. So what's special about Polaris is really that it's directly above the North Pole of the Earth. And that's totally by accident. Um, it didn't have to be there. In fact, there didn't have to be any star right there, but it just happens to be right over the North Pole. So when our Earth spins, it stays still and everything else looks like it's going around that star. So that's kind of special. Now, if you're facing Polaris looking at the North Star and since it's directly over the North Pole then it does another thing for you It actually tells you what direction you're looking helps you navigate at night A lot of people know about using the Sun to find east and west during the day Polaris will help you find north at night so you can see it's directly above the end on the horizon however it is not an easy star to find because it is not one of the brightest stars in the sky so a little trick here to note if you can find the Big Dipper uh, without any help or with some help, once you find the Big Dipper, the two stars at the end of the Dipper where things would fall out of the spoon, those are called the pointer stars because if we follow them, they point right at the North Star. So they point to the North Star. Now you've got the North Star. Now you know which way North is and you're good to go. And once you start really looking in the sky regularly, it becomes easier to find this since Polaris is always in the same place. You kind of get the hang of where it is. But if you ever need some help, that Big Dipper and the Pointer Stars will help you figure it out. All right, I'm going to change these guys just to show you. Everybody sees different things in the stars. Thousands of years ago when all of the ancient cultures were naming stars and making constellations, everybody saw different stuff, right? It's just imagination. So while some of us today see dippers, spoons, a long time ago, the Greeks actually made totally different pictures out of these guys, and it'll change, there we go. Um, so what we're seeing here is the same exact stars with some extra ones added on, and now they're called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Ursa Major and Ursa Minor are the great bear and the little bear. So the Greeks used a little more imagination, used a few more stars, and made these pictures into bears instead of spoons. Right? But we still have a small one and a big one. For many people in your backyards where it's really not typically very dark, it's hard to see a bear. The seven that make up the spoon of the Big Dipper are pretty bright. And then after that, the rest of these guys are much, much fainter. 
uh, keep in mind, in the time of the Greeks, there were, there were no shopping malls, there were no street lights, there were no car lights. It was really nice and dark at night. So they didn't have any problems seeing these smaller, fainter stars. For us, it gets a little trickier with all of our light pollution. All right, we're gonna clear those guys away. And I'm gonna show you one more constellation that's over in that northern sky. It is very low in the sky right now. It's with us all the time, but it's much more prominent and easier to see in the winter time. But I thought I'd point it out, if you have a nice clear northern horizon, if you look way down low in the sky, you're gonna see some stars that seem to make out the letter W. A lot of people refer to this as the W in the sky. This is actually the constellation Cassiopeia. So she is a lady sitting in a chair. There's a whole story about her, and there's a whole bunch of characters that go with her. But most of those guys have set, and they won't be showing up again until the wee morning hours uh, as we go into the summertime, because they're really wintertime constellations. Um, so Cassiopeia does stay visible all year round, but she dips way down in the summertime, close to the northern horizon. So if you have that's a all I needed to know, because when I paint, sometimes anything, I guess it slides over. Then you're going to miss Cassiopeia because she's pretty low down in the sky. But it is pretty easy to find that W. Harder to make it into a lady in a chair, but again, you got to use some imagination. All right, what we're going to do here is we're going to rotate to the west. So we're just going to, as if we were all standing outside, we'd just turn slowly to the west. And I'll show you some constellations that are over there. And again, the first one is kind of low down because we're losing this constellation. It's really mostly a summer, or sorry, a wintertime constellation. But these stars low in the west, if you have a clear western horizon, you'll see the stars of Gemini. So the Gemini twins, Pollux and Castor, uh, the story goes that they are twins, born to the same mother, but they actually have different fathers. So Castor is, his father is the king of Sparta, and his mother is the queen. but Pollux is the son of Zeus. So a little strange there. The, the Greek stories are sometimes a little odd. Um, but what this means is that Pollux is immortal and Castor is not. And they go off on all kinds of adventures. These brothers are very close and they, they share in lots of adventures and battles. And ultimately Pollux is wounded, mortally wounded, and Castor, um, sorry, Castor is mortally wound, wounded and Pollux doesn't want his brother to die, so he goes to Zeus and asks for him to help him out. And Zeus tells that uh, Pollux that he can share his immortality with Castor if they are placed in the sky. And so that's what Zeus did. He placed them in the sky, and now they're always together. The stars right at the tops of the two constellations' heads, those are the two brightest stars in the constellation, and they share the names of the brothers. And these are probably going to be kind of on top of each other, I apologize. but Castor's on the right, Pollux is on the left. So you can see that if you have a clear view of the western horizon, at least for a little while, once we get into the middle of the summer, those guys are gonna disappear on us. All right, we're going to get rid of those guys and turn again, we're gonna go to the south. The southern sky is the fun part of the sky once we get into summer. Lots of really cool stuff to see here, not just constellations, uh, but we'll start with those. We have got, you should be able to see our big dipper nice and high. If we were, we're turned 180 degrees from where we started, but there's our Big Dipper. And if you remember the, the trick, we follow the arc to find Arcturus, there it is. But what you'll notice is there's some bright stars down here, a little bit lower in the southern sky. So I'm gonna put that whole thing back up there. And we're gonna see Virgo and Spica. Virgo is the virgin, right? This is one of those zodiac signs. And Spica is the brightest star in that zodiac sign. Most of the other stars in this constellation are pretty faint, and it doesn't, it's kind of hard to make it into a, it's sort of a weird stick person. Um, but Spica is the really bright star just behind the whole picture. And if I put back our Big Dipper and our arc, what you'll notice is it fits in with the whole theme of following the arc to Arcturus, and then you speed on to Spica. So when you see these bright stars in the sky, you might be wondering, which ones are those? If you can find the Big Dipper, it'll show you that if you just keep following this curve, the arc, you get to Arcturus, and then keep going in with that same arc, and you get to Spica. So you follow the arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. And that's about probably all you'll make out of the Virgo constellation, because it really is hard to see those other little stars. 
also in our southern sky and pretty prominent in the first part of the evening is Leo, Leo the lion. This is one of my favorites because it really does look like what it's supposed to look like. It's always fun when you don't have to use so much imagination. So what you need to know is he's a lion that's laying down, right? You could have a lot of different lions, but this one's laying down, he's kind of sleepy, and he has this very famous curve that goes around the outside of his head that's referred to as the sickle. Um, so it traces out the back of his head. It looks like a backwards question mark. And then the rest of him is sort of this long rectangle and a triangle for the very back of the line where his tail comes off the end of the triangle. Um, there's even some other stars that they haven't connected in this picture, but it really does look exactly like a lion laying down. Um, some people speculate that the Sphinx was carved to look much like Leo, the constellation, but we really don't have any proof of that pure speculation. Um, he does have a bright star right at the bottom of the question mark. That star's name is Regulus. So again, lots of star names out there. At the moment, tonight, we have the moon up right in this constellation. So if I get rid of Leo, you'll see he's basically sitting right on top of the moon. And what we have tonight, uh, if you can see it out there in the real sky, is a waning crescent moon. So we're headed toward new moon. It's going to get darker each night. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is just take you on a trip and we're going to go visit the moon. So again, this is going to, this is really impressive in the planetarium. It's going to look a little strange on your screen, but we're going to actually fly to that moon. So we're going to leave the earth and our grass and our little north, south, east, west guys will eventually disappear. And you'll see the earth underneath us. And we're going to head to the moon. And when we get there, we'll get to see it nice and close up. Um, so obviously you can see the moon very easily from the earth and you can even see various splotches and kind of colorations on it. If you've got a small telescope or some really powerful binoculars, you can see some details on the moon. It's a nice large object, doesn't take a whole lot of power uh, to see it, but if you can see it close up, you get a lot more detail. So here's our moon close up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cheat. At the moment, we're looking at the current phase of the moon, which leaves a lot of it in the dark. So what I'd like to do is light the whole thing up for you so that we don't have to guess at what's over on that other side. So we'll go ahead and light it all up as though it's full. And now that we're here, of course, we got lots of details. The splotches, the dark areas and the lighter areas that you can clearly see from the earth, which people refer to sometimes as a face or lots of people see different things. Some people see a lady with long hair or a frog or whatever, but those light and dark splotches are called maria. So the darker areas, the maria, are uh, it's Latin for seas. Many hundreds of years ago, people speculated what are these dark spots on the moon, and they thought perhaps it's water, oceans. So they named them that, and then we slowly figured out that you know there's no water on the moon. That's just really dark rock. So. There's different kinds of rock on the moon, just as you would have on the earth, right? Um, this is actually, the darker areas are actually old lava flows. So billions of years ago, the moon had lava on its surface and the darker area is now hardened lava, which we would call basalt. So, and we can tell that it's darker just from looking at it here on the earth. And so these big splotches, we still call them oceans, even though they're not, are just areas where there used to be pools of molten lava billions of years ago. The moon hasn't been volcanically active in a very long time, so this is old stuff. We can also see, not from the Earth, but with a telescope, uh, not with our eyes, with a telescope, or now that we're here close, all the craters. There are these craters all over the moon where space rocks have slammed into it over billions of years. The moon is no longer geologically active. Uh, it hasn't been geologically active for a while. So many of these craters are pretty old. They're just scars left over from a long time ago when impacts were much more frequent. Um, thankfully for us, they aren't as frequent anymore and there aren't that many really big things floating around in space. But they used to be. Um, there used to be a lot more of them and you can see the, the impact craters here on the moon from a long time ago. So I'm going to label, just for fun, we know that people have been on the moon and I can point out where every single one of our astronauts, uh, groups of astronauts have been. So we've got six here. Uh, you'll notice it starts at 12, it ends at 17 and 13 is suspiciously missing, right? That's the infamous Apollo 13 that didn't get to land. But they went all over the place. Uh, we purposely picked uh, land, different landing areas to sample different spots on the moon. 
And there's a lot of talk now that people may be going back to the moon. We have a whole new recruit of astronauts uh, with the intention of eventually, in the very near future, of sending them back to the moon. We have never sent people to the backside of the moon. Um, this is the side of the moon that we see every single night. The moon rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the Earth. And so that means it presents the same face to us all the time. So whether it's a crescent moon, a quarter moon, gibbous or full, you're always looking at the same side. And that means the back side of the moon never faces the Earth. It gets just as much sunlight as the front side does, but it makes it impossible for us to talk with our astronauts when they are behind the moon. We talk to the astronauts via radio signals and radio signals don't go through the moon. In order to speak with anybody that's on the back of the moon, we would need a satellite that orbits the moon that can relay the signal. And until very recently, such a satellite was never put into orbit around the moon. But the Chinese space agency has done exactly that. They have now landed a, a rover on the back of the moon. No people yet, but they have a rover back there and they're able to communicate with it because they put a satellite in orbit around the moon. So now that they've done that, we have ability to communicate with anything that's on the back side. So I don't know what NASA's plans are for the next group of astronauts if they want to explore the back of the moon or keep them on the front. Um, but when they're on the front, it makes it very easy for us to talk to them. We just point our radio signals at the moon and we can talk back and forth, no problem. All right, so we're gonna clear those guys off. And I thought we could look at some deep sky objects. So we, there's a lot of constellations. And like I said, this area of the sky, the low southern sky, is my favorite area once we get further into the summer. You can just start to see Scorpio rising in the southeast. And that's a really fun constellation with lots of hidden gems. But we're not quite there yet. Uh, that'll be more toward July. Uh, but in the meantime, there are some fun little objects that you can try and find with a good pair of binoculars. If you have a telescope, that's great, but a lot of people don't. And since I know there's a lot of nature folks here that probably have some very nice binoculars for birding, you can use those to look at the night sky as well. So there's a few objects in our current night sky that are good binocular objects. We have got the constellation Cancer over in the western sky. It's higher than Gemini, Gemini's right here, um, kind of not quite as far up as Leo, so in between those two. And I have to admit, it's not a very exciting constellation. It has very few stars that you can really see with your eyes, and it doesn't look anything like a crab, if you ask me. But it's like this giant letter Y. In here is hiding what we call a star cluster. And I'm gonna label it, and then we'll take a close look at it. It's got a number, M44, <laughs> but it's called the Beehive Cluster. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to zoom in on that as though we were looking at it with a pair of binoculars. Okay? Um, so we're going to center it up. We'll get rid of the labels one by one, and then we're going to center it up. So this would be better if we face west because it's kind of lower in the western sky. And then we're going to zoom in as though we were looking with a telescope or a pair of binoculars. And what we'll start to see is this little pattern that's showing up here in the middle of the screen. Now with your eyes, if it's a nice dark site uh, that you're at, you can often see just a little smudge spot in the sky. So again, Cancer doesn't really jump out at you, but if you find Leo the lion, he's facing Cancer. Uh, he's facing the Gemini twins. So if you can find Gemini, which has got a couple bright stars, and you find Leo, which is pretty easy, right in between there is Cancer. And if you look very closely, there'll be this little smudge. That's where you want to look with your binoculars. And you'll see that that little smudge is actually a whole group of stars. It's called a star cluster. Uh, and a star cluster is different than a constellation. When we look at Leo the lion and connect the dots and make it into a picture, those stars are not actually next to each other in space. We see them as being in the same direction, but they're all at different distances from us. And we have no way of judging distance in the night sky. So to us, it just looks like a flat blackboard. But all those stars in Leo are, some of them are very far away and some of them are very close. So they weren't physically associated with each other. It's just a projection. 
here, these stars are actually physically together in space. And in fact, they're basically siblings. These stars are all born out of the same cloud in space. They all have the same composition. Uh, they all have the same age. They're not identical. Some of them are bigger or smaller or hotter or brighter or fainter or cooler, but they are siblings and they're physically associated with each other. So that's what makes it a cluster instead of a constellation. And so this one's called the beehive. It kind of looks like a bunch of little bees. <laughs> and so that's what they called it. We're going to put that one back where it goes, but it is one that you can see in the night sky. Even without binoculars, it'll just look like a little smudge spot in between our Gemini twins and Leo the lion here. Um, so a little trick when you're trying to see something that's really hard to see, especially at, at night when it's when your eyes are not working so well, use your peripheral vision. Don't look straight at the object, look off to the side. Your eyes are much more sensitive when you use your peripheral vision. We've got another one of those clusters in a different constellation. Uh, this time it's over in the constellation Hercules. So we'll put Hercules up. It's over in the Eastern sky. So this one's gonna be with us all summer long. Again, Hercules is kind of a mess of uh, lines over here, but what most people notice is this trapezoid shape. It's called the keystone right there in Hercules. So that is not super bright, but you can usually pick it out in the sky. And what we're going to look at is another one of those little smudge spots that's right along the side of that trapezoid. So we'll label it first. This one is called M13, Hercules Cluster. Uh, and we're going to zoom in on this one. This one is harder to see, so I wouldn't expect most people to be able to find it without any binoculars or a telescope. But if you can find Hercules and you can find that little trapezoid, you're going to look right along one of the sides of it in between the two stars, almost smack dab in the middle of the two stars, a little off to one side. And this one is again, it's a star cluster. It's a different kind of cluster. There's many more stars in this one. The last one we looked at was a few stars and they were kind of spread out. That's called an open cluster. This is called a globular cluster. You can see why it looks like a glob of stars. <laughs> so almost it reminds me always of a spider's egg. And in the middle, the stars are so densely packed, they all just blend together. So it looks like a little fuzzball. These stars are very old. These are some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. Again, they are physically associated with each other. They are actually together, they're siblings in space. Um, but here, instead of hundreds of stars, you have hundreds of thousands of stars in this group. Um, and like I said, they're very old. The other ones that we looked at, um, those are younger stars. They have nice bright blue stars, are a little more spread out. So these are a couple of binocular objects you can try for, or you know, if you have a telescope, you probably already know about these guys. But there are a couple of the ones that we have in our current night sky. I'll put our regular sky back here. And then what I wanted to just point out is again going back to the southeast Scorpio that's a little taste of what's coming up later in the summer once Scorpio the scorpion actually rises he doesn't actually get too high up in our sky he stays very low in the south but the tail of the scorpion and then right next door is will be Sagittarius which is the archer but a lot of people call it the teapot because it looks exactly like a teapot in between those constellations are a ton of these clusters and again many of them easily seen with a pair of binoculars. You don't even have to really know what you're looking for there. If you go to the tail of Scorpio and just start scanning the sky with your binoculars, you'll find one cluster after another. So it's a really rich field to check out with a good pair of binoculars. Um, but right now you're going to have to go out like one o'clock in the morning. If you just wait until later in the summer, it becomes more reasonable time of night. Um, all right, so that's kind of an overview of the constellations and some interesting objects that are up in the current early summer, late spring sky. I'm happy to um, point out anything that people are interested in seeing or if anybody has any questions talking about something we saw or something we didn't see, I'd be happy to take questions. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you can, uh, we can take a few questions. We have uh, about 100 people online right now, uh, but uh, unmute yourself and, and, and feel free to ask a question. Can you show us a black hole? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, good question. I could just make my whole screen black and that's what that would be what we would be looking at. I can't show you a black hole. I, um, I can show you a great picture of, of, of the first image ever of a black hole. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it already. But um, yeah, we just last fall uh, got the first image ever of a black hole. Why was those up? Why were those uh, other stars, uh, old stars and other new stars? How does that happen? So stars age just like people um, and open clusters that we see are newly formed stars. Um, those globular clusters that have the old stars, if we would go back in time, mm -hmm. at some point in time, they would be young stars. Um, and we would find that there's a bunch of bright blue ones, just like we saw in the open cluster. The bright blue, really bright, really massive stars have very short lives. So when we have a group like that, um, none of them, uh, none of our groups are all identical stars. There's always a range of, of uh, masses, a range of sizes, a range of brightnesses. The only thing that they share is they're all together in space and they're all the same age. But we all know, just like people, people's lifetimes are all different. Uh, even twins, people who are twins or, or triplets, they all start together, but they don't all end together. So our stars, the really big bright blue ones, burn out very quickly. So when we look at those globular clusters, by the time we're looking at them and they're billions of years old, the big bright blue stars are all gone already. They've already died off. Whereas the open clusters, because they're newer, their whole, all of the ages are much younger. We can see those big, bright blue stars. Hey, Karen, we had a question online. It said, you know, are there any nebula uh, that can be seen with a small telescope? And, and I gave it my best answer. Uh, I pointed them towards uh, Orion in, in the winter uh, with the bare eyes, but uh, I thought you might be able to elaborate beyond my expertise, which is nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, Orion's a great one in the winter. And of course, if you want to get up at the wee hours of the morning, you can still see Orion, um, but that's usually not when people want to go out looking at stars. So in the early evening, like I said, when Scorpio gets higher, um, there's a whole bunch of clusters and nebula in there. The Lagoon Nebula is a great one in Scorpio. The Trifid Nebula is also in there with Sagittarius and Scorpio. Those are all great um, objects for the summertime. Uh, and I'm getting some other questions too as well. And, and some of the things might be uh, answered. Um, it, it wasn't a direct question. Someone wanted to know about the, the, the planets that are visible uh, during the summer. Well, the other thing I will do is make a plug for uh, folks, if you're interested, there's a, a software out there called Stellarium. Um, and it's uh, free shareware, and you can download that to your to your PC, and you can also buy a version uh, for your phone and use it to navigate the the night sky with your iPhone. So uh, yeah. that's that's something that I've used, and it really uh, it masks my ignorance. So. <laughs> there are a ton of apps for phones that are free, and then that you can always pay to get rid of the ads kind of thing. My favorite one is Star Chart, and these are the ones where you just take it outside and you point the camera at what you're looking at and it tells you what you're looking at. Um, but those can be used also to say, well, what's gonna be up next month as well? So Stellarium is a great one as well. Um, right now we are kind of devoid of planets. It's kind of sad, um, but that, that, that's changing all the time. The planets are constantly in motion. So there's not ones that are summer planets. There are ones that are up at this time of day or night during this time of this year. So it's always changing. Uh, at the moment, Venus is up just briefly after sunset. Now, if you can have a clear view of the Western horizon, you'll see it no problem because Venus is so bright, you don't even need to wait for the sky to get all the way dark. It's the brightest object in the sky other than the sun and the moon. So it is out there, it is in the evening sky, but it's setting very shortly after sunset. So if you go out right after sunset, you might be missing it already, especially if you have trees or houses or anything in the way. Um, but what's coming up, uh, we will have some of the giant planets coming up in the later summer. You'll be able to see Jupiter and Saturn, and I believe even Mars, but I think Mars comes up um, kind of late in the night. But at this particular moment in time, there's really nothing in the early. One of the uh, one of the things that uh, someone asked, and and again, I, I made it a, a chance to answer this was: Are any galaxies uh, uh, visible uh, at night with the naked eye? And I 
I, I suggested Andromeda in a very nice sky, dark sky, but I, I'll leave it up to, to you. Yeah, the only one that you can really see in the Northern Hemisphere without a telescope is Andromeda, and it's a, a classic wintertime object. But it, again, when we say that it's a winter object, it just means that if you want to see it at a different time of year, you got to go out at like four o'clock in the morning. Um, there's only a very small window of time where you can't see an object because it's directly in line with the sun. Um, so Andromeda, you could still get a peek at, but you're going to have to go out at a, maybe an uncomfortable time of night. Um, there's nothing in the summer sky in the northern hemisphere. Hey, Karen. Yes. Uh, just, just curious. Uh, for, first of all, it's really interesting. Thanks for doing this. Um, secondly, do you have do you have any um, tips for us to maybe get a glimpse of the comet Swan that uh, supposedly is? coming around soon or is around now, I guess? Yeah, it's actually been around and it's sort of peaked already. Um, oh. But I will show you, I, I anticipated someone would ask this, so I will show you where it's located. It's in the constellation and it, it's moving all the time. But at the moment, it's in the constellation Auriga, which is uh, rising. Uh, and let me see, I have to, hang on, I have to get my screen. I have too many screens open here. <laughs> get this it, out of the way. I'll show you where. Oh, is. is it visible with the naked eye or do you need do you need binoculars or a telescope or comets are usually best with binoculars um, because a telescope usually gets you too close uh, too zoomed in and oftentimes they're not bright enough with the naked eye um sorry i'm trying to type and do this at sure i'm sorry <laughs> Um, so, but this one I have not been looking for. So let me just show you where Auriga is. So there it is, sorry. Um, okay. it's setting in the evening. Um, so you're gonna see it in the, uh, after sunset, way over in the um, uh, Northwest uh, sky. Okay. And it's near, let me put the star that it's near. It's the brightest star in the constellation is called Capella. And so it's in that general area. So you could okay. take out your um, binoculars on a nice clear night and see if you can try and find it. It is fading though. So unfortunately it's only gonna get fainter. It's this little guy right there, Capella. Oh wow, okay. Um, but you can find online uh, maps that will kind of show you the path of the comet as it moves through the sky. So you can see like where it's headed. Uh, so this is for tonight's sky, um, but it moves pretty fast, so. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate sure it. Thing. We got time for a couple more questions. If anybody has one, can you show us a pulsar or a quasar? <laughs> I mean, I could put the dot on the screen, and that's all it would be. There's no real image of these things, pulsars or quasars. We have like artists' renditions and and stuff like that. And any. Uh, Kind of images you would get would be from things like radio telescopes so it's not really the same as a picture um, so we don't really have visible like normal pictures of those kinds of objects um, they're spread out all over the sky i could do uh, let me see if i can do this uh, so they're not visible even with an op any optical telescope they some quasars are pulsars can be um, pulsars turn uh, they have the name pulsars because they appear to turn on and off. So what you get is a signal and then nothing and a signal and then nothing. So there's what you would get is um, a measurement of the light coming from that object over a function of time. So you'd have a light curve for a pulsar, not necessarily really an image of it. Uh, it would just be a little dot in the sky that was there and then not there, there and then not there. That's what the pictures look like. It's not really that exciting to look at. It's an exciting object. It just doesn't create an exciting picture, if that makes any sense. So it doesn't blink fast enough for us to notice it blinking? If the light coming from it is so faint that you wouldn't notice it with your um, eyes. All of the um, stars that we see in the night sky are all within our own galaxy, and they're all incredibly close by in our galaxy. Our eyes are not sensitive enough to see stars, say, on the other side of our own galaxy, let alone stars in other galaxies as individual dots. So pulsars can only be seen with telescopes and not like your backyard telescopes, very, very large research style telescopes. Are people looking for objects that might hit the Earth? Yes. So there's a whole um, 
a group of telescopes that look for near-Earth objects all the time. And, and the nice thing is mostly they're robotic uh, because things that are moving through space that are a good size are actually easy to find by just surveying the sky regularly. So these robotic telescopes, they take images of the entire sky every night. And then the next night they go and do it again. And there's software that looks for things that change. And this is how we find things like supernovae, but also asteroids and comets and things like that. Um, so once the computer says, hey, something moved from last night tonight in this frame, then people are alerted to come and check it out and make sure that it, you know, it is what we think it is. And that's how we find lots and lots of these near Earth objects. And then we keep tabs on the really big ones, the little tiny ones we don't have to worry about so much. But yeah, there are near Earth objects and then there are potentially hazardous near Earth objects. And those are the ones that are really monitored and, and kept track of at all times. Uh, Karen, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the time that you spent. We really appreciated uh, you coming on board here uh, uh, for this event. Thank you very much. And um, again, if anybody has any questions afterwards, you can forward them to virtual uh, AMP at Gmail, and I'll make sure that Dr. Schwartz gets those uh, and that we can respond to them. But again, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. It was wonderful and appreciate your time. Good so, thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. That was great. It was great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Wonderful.